Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Divya Madan. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. As you all know that this time INI was conducted in two sessions. I have posted uh, the recall of uh, session one, the pediatrics recall specifically. Uh, this video is regarding the session two recall. So without further, further ado, let's get started with the questions. So the first question I came across was about, about the prognostic factors of ARL. Again, a previous year question uh, implying that how much a previous year questions are important in your uh, competitive exam, be it INI, be it NEET PG. So the options are somewhat like age less than one year of age, uh, translocation 411, translocation 922 and hyperploidy. It's very easy to rule out in this case. Uh, you can easily uh, see that uh, here age less than one year and more than 10 years is a poor prognostic factor. So it's bad. Translocation, wherever you see this 11 chromosome, it's a very nasty chromosome, a bad prognosis again. 922 Philadelphia chrom chromosome, again a bad prognostic factor and hyperploidy is a favorable factor. Okay, so this is the favorable, rest all were bad. So uh, let's see the list here. The favorable factors age between 1 to 9 counts uh, less than 20,000 female gender hyperdiploidy no blast in response to the treatment on day 8 and day 15 uh, achievement of bone marrow remission and MRD that is a minimal uh, residual status of the disease less than 1% are favorable ones and unfavorable are the deviation here and there right like age less than 1 more than 10 counts more than 50,000 a male gender hypodiploidy is a bad prognostic factor again philadelphia chromosome prince of blast after your uh, induction therapy here are the list of chromosomes that have the poor prognostic factor they include uh, 922 811 and 814 low hypoploidy and complex karyotype are also poor prognostic factors it comes to good prognostic factor uh, it is hyperdiploidy and deletion 9q so now coming on to the next question. It was a really basic question. Uh, image like this was given. We all know what it is. It is a Sharkey tape. And some of the options that I, I could recall were that this, um, uh, the object that is shown in this image is used as one of the parameters of malnutrition, which is true. Uh, it is one of the uh, uh, used to measure mid upper arm circumference. That is uh, one of the parameters we assess uh, for malnutrition. This is a Sharkey tape. Third was the value between 12.5 and 13.5 centimeter is suggestive of severe malnutrition. And D is that it can be done by frontline workers. So I think uh, option A is correct, option B is correct, option D is correct. But we all know, as you can see in this image as well, the red line, the red zone begins at the level of 11.5, right? So severe malnutrition is something which is less than 11.5, something which between 11.5 to 12.5 is the yellow zone and above 12.5 is green zone that the nutritional status of the child is adequate as of now so c option is the wrong one and uh, if you had to pick up a false statement then this would be the correct option now coming on uh, to the third question uh, Caesar management was asked uh, the sequence of drugs that are used that are used in status epilepticus in the first session they asked status asthmaticus and in the second session it was status epilepticus so uh, keep in mind that in neat pg also they are going to ask either one of the emergencies in the management which is very basic so uh, initially uh, there was a confusion whether they asked about neonatal seizures or status epilepticus in a child uh, and I think majority of you uh, gave out a review that it was status epilepticus and not neonatal seizures. And uh, management of both of the seizures is difficult in a way because hypocalcemia also comes in the picture and neonatal seizures we more focus on the metabolic derangements. So now coming on to the management of status epilepticus in a child, I'll uh, give a short overview how we clinically manage a child in status and I'll show a clip it off from OP Guy textbook of pediatrics because that's what most of you must be studying uh, during your MBBS period, right? 
so first of all whenever you receive a child in status epilepticus in the first 5 minutes you firstly stabilize the child right you maintain the airway breathing circulation provide adequate oxygenation you check the blood sugar and if it's low you correct the hypoglycemia by pushing 2 ml of uh, kg of d10 uh, that is dextrose 10% dextrose and if still the seizure is persisting you give benzodiazepine right the first line therapy include iv midazolam or diazepam or lorazepam we can do give any one of these uh, the doses range from 0.2 mg per kg 0.2 mg per kg and for lorazepam it is 0.1 m ml per uh, mg per kg right and you can repeat the dose after 6 minutes if the seizure is persisting right now coming on to the second line therapy which includes phenytoin phosphenytoin valproate and levetiracetam we all know the doses phenytoin 15 to 20 mg per kg valproate 20 to 40 mg per kg and levetiracetam 30 to 60 mg per kg and if any of these is not available we use phenobarbital 15 mg per kg as loading dose right so this is the basic uh, management and if seizures still persist you can repeat that comes with, uh, under the three third line therapy you can repeat any of the second line agents if they were not used earlier and uh, lastly phenobarbital coma or midaz midazolam infusion let's see how ghai gives this flow chart because that's what was asked in the exam they asked you how to uh, the sequence of the drugs that are used in the management so here is a screenshot of uh, a uh, your op uh, ghai textbook this is a clip it so okay when whenever there is an acute seizure again as i told uh, that you have to stabilize the child first secure the airway breathing circulation and administer oxygen right then you have to look about if it is uh, what is the cause right uh, any acute uh, metabolic derangement you check electrolytes glucose calcium magnesium lfts blood counts and toxicology if indicated and you abort the seizure by using lorazepam or midazolam and you can give them up to two doses 6 minutes apart and correct the metabolic abnormality iv glucose or iv calcium right if the seizure still continues you administer phenytoin or phosphenytoin at the dose of 20 mg per kg and you can repeat if needed up to 10 mg per kg right so phenytoin loading dose can go up to 30 mg per kg in total the second drug here mentioned is valproate 20 to 40 mg per kg levetiracetam 20 to 60 and the it should be given in the infusion at 5 mg and lastly phenytoin and you can repeat and go up to 10 mg per kg after all these drugs valproate phenytoin valproate levetiracetam and phenobarbital you start an iv infusion of midazolam at 1 to 15 microgram per kg per minute and if still the seizure is persisting you induce a coma by phenobarbital or thiopentol or propofol and lastly you can consider iv ketamine or oral uh, topiramate so as soon as you start iv midazolam therapy the child needs to be in intensive care because uh, as you are providing sedation there are more chances that you uh, need to ventilate the child you need to secure an airway through endotracheal tube and put the child on ventilator okay so now coming on to the next question uh, next question was a vaccine question uh, vaccines that are not to be given in a child undergoing splenectomy actually the all the options that i could recollect are given uh, uh, in a child uh, with uh, that has undergone uh, splenectomy so i don't know which one uh, was the odd one out if there was one the options i could uh, recollect was meningococcal which is given pneumococcal that is given hib vaccine that should be given typhoid vaccine again should be given influenza vaccine should be given uh, the concept behind is this uh, the spleen is major major uh, defense against the capsulated bacteria and uh, organisms so removal of spleen predisposes that individuals to capsulated infections through capsulated organisms right that's why we need to vaccinate them Uh, preferably two weeks before the splenectomy is planned if it's an elective procedure and if uh, it is it was an emergency procedure like during trauma or uh, something else then uh, at the time of discharge or two weeks after that procedure we give this vaccination right it's more of a surgery question now uh, you must have read uh, about opsi that is opportunistic post splenectomy infections right uh, still uh, 
no vaccine is again contraindicated when it comes to uh, a splenectomy, uh, an individual that has undergone splenectomy. So I think all these options were correct. If you have to choose best one, I think typhoid would be the one. Uh, rest all are given. Now coming on to the next question, they asked for a sequence of workup for three year old child with UTI. Again, a repeated question, a basic question, and I have attached an image from uh, OP Ghai again. Uh, the, your basic textbooks will never leave. So this is again OP Ghai picture. Below one year of child, you do all the three investigation. You go for ultrasound, you go for MCU, that is maturating cystourethrogram, and you go for a DMSA scan, right? As the child grows one to five years, you do ultrasound, ultrasonography, you go for DMSA scan and if any of them is abnormal, then you go for MCU. That is an invasive one, right? And above five years of age, you go for ultrasound. If something is uh, abnormal in that ultrasound, then you go for DMSA and MCU. So here in the question, you were asked a sequence of work for a three year old child, right? So we have seen in this table right now that for one to five years, you go for ultrasound and DMSA and if something is wrong, then you go for MCU. So if a combination of options are given, you go uh, go for uh, ultrasound and DMSA as number one. And the second one would be MCU. Okay. Now coming on to the next question. I think this question was missed during our first session. Uh, I got uh, uh, information about this question later on before that video was made. So in session one, uh, a scenario like Kawasaki disease was given, I think. It was classical Kawasaki disease. And as soon as I heard about that there was a question on Kawasaki, uh, image from my notes just popped in my head because uh, you revise them again and again. And my source has become my notes now. So here's uh, a clip it there. These are my notes. Uh, if some of you want to check them out, then there's a link in the description box you can check so uh, i remember kawasaki disease medium vessel vasculitis seen in children less than five years of age and there's a mnemonic for its clinical features and the diagnostic criteria and that mnemonic i made was febrile f for fever e for ananthems b for bulbar conjunctivitis r for rash i for internal organ involvement l for lymphadenopathy and e for extremity changes okay so i think uh, that was a typical scenario that was given and few uh, statements were given and you had to choose about the wrong one right uh, you have to choose about the correct one uh, this there was aseptic uh, sorry there was the first question was uh, first option was raised ASR CRP and uh, thrombocytosis second was first line is oral corticosteroids uh, third was IVIG is used in refractory cases and D meningitis is seen and uh, there was another option that was ferritin more than 1500 uh, is essential for diagnosis so you have seen the diagnostic criteria ferritin is definitely not uh, uh, mentioned in the criteria so it's strong uh, now coming on to the management management we all know that ivig is the uh, gold standard here the ivig is the treatment of choice and it's also saying that uh, this ivig should be given within 10 days of the onset of disease because it significantly decreases the risk of aneurysm. If you have given IVIG in the treatment, then the risk of aneurysm is just 1% with, whereas without IVIG, it's 25%. So you can see how, what a huge difference it's making, right? So IVIG is the treatment of choice. It uh, Oral corticosteroids are not. And IVIG is used in all the cases, should be used in all the cases. So it's not just used in refractory cases, all the cases. Raised ESR, CRP and thrombocytosis, it's seen. And meningitis can be seen, yes, aseptic meningitis can be seen in cases of Kawasaki disease, so it's true. So correct options are A and D in this case. Coming on to the next question. Uh, it was a question on febrile seizure, again a clip it from Ghai because you can easily rule out from these options. Uh, they asked what is not a risk factor for recurrence i could recollect only three options one was the family history family history is definitely a risk factor for recurrence caesar at a lower temperature that is less than 38 degrees celsius is again a risk factor caesar at higher temperatures is normal right the higher the temperature the more chances of getting a caesar but uh 
per se seizure at higher temperature is not a risk factor for recurrence in fact even if uh, if you are getting seizure at a lower temperature that is a risk factor and you can easily see here uh, all the risk factors that i've mentioned in ghai yes uh it's age family history multiple seizures and uh, first seizure at a lower temperature right so these are all the risk factor at higher temperature this is not a risk factor so this is the correct option here so i think that's it uh that was recall a short recall video of inct november 22 session 2 for pediatrics i hope uh, you have gotten a just that this exam requires more focus on the previous year questions and revision for the last 7 to 10 days of those high yield questions uh all the best for your further exams and i hope uh, all the uh, good luck that uh, you ace all your exams and your all your hard work is not going into waste see you next time in another video bye bye